talk a little bit about the realities of the HTML5 playback environment. Then we'll jump into producing H.264 for HTML5, and then we'll spend the last few minutes talking about WebM. <clears throat> In terms of HTML5 playback environment, um, I grabbed these browser market share statistics this morning. Um, so this is from a website called Net Market Share, and they they show browser penetration by browser and also by version. And version's more important because not all versions of each browser support HTML5. So if you take that information, and what I did here was I went to that site and I grabbed all the browser versions that had a share of 1% or higher. And then I, you know, the shares in the share column on the left, is it HTML5 compatible? Yes, no. And you know, the big, the big non-HTML5 compatibles, of course, are Microsoft Internet Explorer 8, um, 6, and 7. And those total about 42% of the environment. So right now, as of you know, the, the, the latest we could have statistics, you know, we're looking at 42% of people browsing the internet on computers not being HTML5 compatible. So basically, if, you're, if you decide that you want to use HTML5, unless you're working in an extremely closed environment where you control you know, the browser everybody has in that environment, maybe a corporation, maybe a school, then you're going to need to encode for HTML5 and for fallback using typically Flash or Silverlight or QuickTime or Windows Media, I guess. You could do that as well. So right now, the penetration isn't sufficient to use an HTML5-only solution. Um, that issue is a bit compounded by the fact that not all of the HTML5 browsers support all the same codecs. Okay, so this is this is a screenshot from Dive into HTML5. It's a wonderful resource. You see the URL, and it, it shows the three HTML5 compatible codecs. You've got Agathiora on top, and that plays in Firefox 3.5, Chrome 5.0, and Opera 10.5. Um, we see H.264 in the middle, that plays only on IE 9.0 and Safari 3.0 plus. Um, it does play in Chrome today, but I guess it was in February, Google said they were going to take H.264 playback out of Chrome. Um, I've tested the latest version I have and it still plays H.264, but they say it's, it's going to be, it's going to be out there, it's going to be out. And then WebM, which is the Google alternative, plays in IE with the plugin. Um, Microsoft has decided they're not going to include VP8 decoding native with the browser. Um, it plays in Firefox 4.0, it plays in Chrome, and it plays in Opera 10.6 and later. So what's this add up to? Um, again, same browsers. And then, you know, which ones play H.264, which ones play WebM, which ones play AUG, and which ones don't play any of them because they're, they're not HTML5 compatible. And as of today, um, you know, if you throw Chrome in the H.264 camp, you know, 29% of the installed base can play H.264, 31% can play WebM, and 5% can play AUG. If you want to support all the HTML5 browsers that have a penetration of 1% or higher, specifically Firefox 3.6, you need to have three iterations of your files if you want to do it in HTML5. So you need one WebM, one AUG, and one H.264 file to serve all of those browsers. OK, is that likely to change? Yeah, I mean, it's going to change when Chrome takes H.264, I'm sorry, when Google takes H.264 out of Chrome. Um, it would cost Opera and, and Mozilla about $5 million a year to license H.264. That's the MPEG LA burden on people who are integrating H.264 into a player or into an encoding tool. There's a maximum fee of $5 million per company per year, Opera said they're not going to pay it. Mozilla says they can't pay it because they only use open source technologies. So 
you know, Apple is pretty steadfast in using H.264. They say WebM has potential patent issues. That's what Microsoft says. They're not going to use it. Um, Mozilla and Opera are never going to pay for H.264. So we're going to have at least two codecs to worry about going forward. And then you, know, you would expect the Firefox 3.6 penetration to, to drop off. But you know, I found one or two sites that really care about HTML5 support you know, for the simple playback in a window that HTML5 does. And they had three file versions. They had OGG, they had WebM, and they had H.264. We're not going to talk about OGG. Um, you know, I, I think that's kind of overkill. You're going to have to do Flash anyway, or you're going to have to do Silverlight anyway, just with 40% that doesn't, that's not HTML5 compatible. So I think if you do WebM and H.264, you're probably, you know, you're probably done enough. But I think anybody considering HTML5 support needs to understand these realities, both the the total penetration of browsers at about maximum of 58% because we know that 42% is not HTML5 compatible and also the, the codec split that looks like it's going to remain split into the foreseeable future. So now that I've depressed everybody, um, let me just Okay, so this kind of makes the last point. You know, we saw 42% not HTML5 compatible, and then the three file iterations for the browsers that each one supports. So let's jump into H.264. Um, what is H.264? What's, you know, what's unique about H.264 is its support in the standards bodies, as well as real world adoption. So the ITU is the International Telecommunications Union. They control telephony, radio, TV. ISO is International Standards Organization. We know MPEG-1, MPEG-2. We know what, what their impacts were in photography, consumer electronics. Um, in 2002, these two standards bodies came together and said, we're going to use the same compression technology. We're going to use ABC. So it's called either H.264 or ABC. It's the same codec. And so you've got tremendous hardware support in the, all those different communities, photography, television, consumer electronics. And then in addition to that, the top three streaming vendors, you know, Apple with QuickTime, Adobe with Flash, Microsoft with Silverlight, they all support H.264. And on top of that, you've got device support with primarily Apple, but also with Android and a bunch of other devices. So H.264 is, you know, has the lion's share of the current market, and it's got so much momentum, it's hard to see any technology really supplanting them in any of these key markets. It's not going to show up in a DVD player. You know, it's not going to show up in a, a set-top box that's not driven by you know, Google or some Google deal. I mean, it's just there's, there's too much hardware support out there for H.264. What does um, H.264 cost? Um, one of the benefits of WebM is that after it came out, MPEG LA, who is the licensing authority for the H.264 patent group, came out and said, we're never going to charge a royalty on H.264 usage for free internet distribution. So prior to 2009, 2010, there were, the first statement was, we're not going to charge any royalty until 2011. And then it was, we're going to reevaluate in 2015. And once MPEG, excuse me, once, um, once Google came out with WebM, they basically said, OK, no royalty in perpetuity. So that's one of the benefits of WebM. They saw competition coming and said, OK, we'll just remove the price. So if you're distributing free internet video, there's never going to be a royalty. Um, however, if you're distributing pay-per-view, if you're distributing subscription-based H.264 video, there, there probably is a royalty obligation. There's some de minimis exceptions, but once you get over a certain length of your big movie or a certain number of subscriptions, you're going to owe a royalty. That's the distribution side. For browsers and coders and players, as I talked about, there's, there's a royalty per unit. Um, you know, Microsoft, I'm sure they're at the maximum now because they've got Silverlight players, they've got expression encoder, encoders, they've got um, IE9 browsers. 
but you know, every, every one they ship, they would owe a royalty on until they get to the $5 million maximum per company per year threshold. And you know, Apple's clearly in that space between the compressor and all the iDevices that they ship and QuickTime, you know, they're clearly at the $5 million mark too. So Microsoft, basically the decision to incorporate H.264 in Safari and Internet Explorer 9 probably cost Apple and Microsoft nothing because they were probably already at the peak of the, um, of the royalty obligation. On the other hand, because Mozilla and Opera don't have other products that use H.264, it would cost them the full $5 million. So in addition to any you know, theoretical issues with using a non-open source technology, you know, five million bucks is five million bucks. So it's free if you're, if you're a producer, it's not free if you're integrating the technology into your player or your encoding tool. Okay, what is an MP4 file? An MP4 file is a file that's produced using the MPEG-4 container format. Okay? Um, there are multiple container formats. There's M4V, that's the Apple variant for iTunes. There's MOV, obviously QuickTime, F4V, H.264 for Flash. Um, and then you can even have H.264 in the MPEG, MPEG transport stream. Okay? So, irrespective of how you encode, irrespective of the container format, um, all the H.264 parameters that you use are going to be identical. So you're going to choose a profile, you're going to choose a level, you're going to choose entropy encoding, irrespective of the container format. But if you're producing for HTML5, you want to use the MP4 container format. Okay? And the reason you want to do that is because if you try to open an MOV file in a browser, what's the browser going to do? It's going to load QuickTime. If you try and load a, an F4V file or an FLV file, it's going to try and load the Flash player. So you should encode it in the MP4 container format for HTML5 deployment. When you're producing for H.264, and these are, these are the settings that you're going to see in every encoding tool that's out there. You've got profiles and levels. You've got entropy encoding. You've got IB and, I, I and B frame settings. Um, what is an H.264 profile? An H.264 profile, and this is from Wikipedia, it defines a set of coding tools or algorithms that can be used in generating a bit stream. So we see, we see three Three profiles that are typically used in this space, baseline, main, and high. Um, and then these are the encoding algorithms that I talked about. So the baseline profile doesn't use B frames, doesn't use CABC entropy encoding, doesn't use 8x8 or 4x4 transforms, and the high profile does. Okay? So when I talk about encoding techniques or algorithms, that's what I'm talking about. And when I talk about levels, Levels are basically layers within the profiles that, that can constrain key parameters. And key parameters, I mean the resolution and data rate. So if you wanna, if you wanna encode for an iDevice, you say, you know, what profile does it support? What level does it support? If you're encoding for HTML5, back, HTML5 playback on computers, you typically don't have to worry about profile or level because all the HTML5 browsers can play back any profile, any level. So if you're producing for iDevices, it's something you need to know about. If you're producing for, um, if you're producing for HTML5 playback, it's not, it's not an issue. Now why do profiles and levels exist? Because it lets device manufacturers build devices with varying power um, that can still play back H.264. So the iPod, the original iPod has relatively low power, it can play H.264 video using the baseline profile. Um, the iPhone 4S is more powerful still than an, than an iPad. You can use the high profile for H.264. So if you're a video producer and you're targeting an iPod audience, and that's pretty frequent because even if you're, even if you're supporting HTML5 on the desktop, you still care about iDevices. If you're producing for 
the original iPod, you need to produce a file that uses the baseline profile. And what does that look like? Most of the encoding tools, we come down here to, here's Sorensen Squeeze 8. It was released by Sorensen, I guess, last week. And the typical encoding controls that you see, you're going to have the ability to choose the profile. Okay? Typically, if you're producing for iDevices, you'll use a preset. The preset will have the right profile in there. If you're producing for HTML5, all you care about is computer playback. You would just go to the high profile here and then encode your file. So that's what that looks like in a typical encoding tool. In a In the Adobe Media Encoder, again, if you're encoding for iDevices, you're probably going to choose a preset that has the profile and level picked for you. But pretty much every H.264 capable encoding tool is going to give you the ability to choose the profile, and that's one of the most basic H.264 encoding parameters. The general rule is, again, you need to you need to choose a profile that's played by the target device. And if, you're, if all you care about is computers, you don't care about producing a file that's going to play on an iDevice, use the high profile. If you care about iDevices or other low power devices, you need to track down which profiles they support and then use those profiles. Otherwise, the files won't load, they won't play. And again, you know, the work that I did is none of the browsers have specifications for the, um, for the players that they support. You know, so taking a step back, I mean, HTML5, the benefit is there is no separate player. You know, the player is in the browser. So what Apple does a really nice job of is they define the specs of each device they ship. So you go to, you say, well, gosh, I want to create a video that plays on an iPad. You just go to the iPad website, you check the technical specs, and Apple says plays main profile up to level 3.1, whatever it is. None of the browser vendors do that, or they, none of them did it that I could find. So what I did was I encoded files using the high profile, using all three levels of audio encoding, and all the browsers played the files. So you're safe up to a 1920 or a 1080p file um, encoded with the high profile using AAC, HE, Audio V2. And, and so you, you pretty much have a lot of flexibility when you're encoding just for the desktop. Obviously, if you're encoding for the desktop and portable devices, you've got you've to encode to the lowest common denominator. And again, use the MP4 file because the F4V or the move format could trigger flash or quick time playback. OK, so this is. Um, If you're including iDevices as a target, you're producing a file It's going to play on desktops under HTML5. I want it to play on iDevices as well. This chart contains the profile and level supported by all generations of iDevices. Okay, so typically what most producers are doing is they're choosing a stream that's in this range and they're saying, okay, I want to play on the original iPhones all iPhones up to the iPhone 4S. I want to play on all iPod Touches and all iPod Classics. And they produce a 640 by 480 stream, baseline profile up to level 3.0. OK? So if you're, again, if you're one file that's going to serve two, two targets, this is what you need to do on the iDevice side. Let me say the. Um, 1080p playback for these devices here, for the iPhone 4S and iPad 2, they only play if you're using an external VGA or an external HDMI connector. Okay, they don't play natively on the device. So if you're encoding a file for playback in the iPhone or in the iPad 2, use the 720p main profile 
specifications for the, I, the iPhone 4 and iPod Touch 4. And I've got a session on encoding for devices this afternoon if anybody's interested going to that in more detail. Okay, so that's profiles and levels. The next option you see in most H.264 encoding tools is called entropy encoding. And CABAC is the high quality, you know, it's more efficient but it's harder to decode. CABLC is less efficient but easier to decode. The general rule is use CABAC when it's available. Um, it's not available for the baseline profile, it is for the high and main profile. What does YouTube do? So this is a file, YouTube encoded using the H.264 format. High profile, CABAC here, two megabits per second, 720p. And because it's targeted for computers, they use the high profile and they enabled CABAC. So that's what I recommend and, and it was fun to check YouTube and make sure that they were doing the same thing. Okay, the last set of parameters I'm going to look at relates to IB and P frames. And IB and P frames are the individual frames that comprise an H.264 encoded stream. So there's three types of frames. One is an iframe, and that's encoded completely self-referentially, meaning it's, it's almost like a JPEG encoded file. Doesn't look for redundancies in any of the other files, it's just totally self-referential. A P frame, which is here, can look backwards for redundancies in previous I frames and previous P frames. Okay? And a B frame can look forward and backwards for redundancies for P frames, B frames, and I frames. Can look in either direction and can, depending on which options you set, can check for redundancies in any of those frame types. So looking at this, which, which frame is the most efficient? What do we know the most efficient from a comp compression perspective? A B frame, because that's the frame that can get the most redundancy, which, and re redundancy is the most efficient way to compress files, right? In a talking head scenario, if nothing changes, you just refer to the previous frame and say, hey, update that to the you know, update that in this frame and just change the, you know, the lips or change the head. So inner frame compression is always the most efficient, so B frames are the most efficient frames. Um, what's the least efficient frame? The I frame, because the I frame doesn't take into account any inter frame compression at all. Okay, so as a general rule, you want to minimize I frames and you want to maximize B frames. And so what do you need to know about these frame types? What controls do you typically look at when you're encoding files? Um, because we want to keep keyframes down to a minimum, keyframes are the same as iframes, we want to enable typically one keyframe every 10 seconds or so. Okay, we want to do that for interactivity purposes. So if I had this video file and I dragged a playhead slider and I dragged it onto this keyframe here, the P frame there doesn't have the information necessary to play back that frame because it's referring to other frames. So what the player would have to do is go back to this file here, excuse me, this frame here, and start playback from that location. Doesn't, if you're playing the file from start to finish, you could have one iframe and it wouldn't be a problem. But typically people stop, they drag the slider, and if you want your videos viewed in that way, you want one keyframe about every 10 seconds to make sure that there's good responsiveness in the player. The other thing you want is you want keyframes at scene changes. Okay, why? Because an iframe is the highest quality frame. If you have a scene change, you have the highest quality frame for all other frames to start referring back to. So all you need to know about keyframes when you're producing H.264 or WebM or anything else for that matter is I want one every 10 seconds or so and I want to enable keyframes on scene changes. And interfaces for that differ Episode uses the concept of a natural keyframe. A natural keyframe for them is a, is a keyframe that happens on a scene change. Um, and then squeeze is the other encoding tool there, and that's, um, they just say auto keyframe on scene change. They just come out and say it. 
So that's all you need to know about keyframes. And then B-frames, um, B-frames add a lot of quality. They are the most efficient file. You want to use them whenever they are available. Typically, you'll see two types of controls for them. You'll see the number of B-frames. This is episode. And the number of B-frames is the number of B-frames between I and P-frames and P and P-frames. So the, fr the uh, B-frame interval here of three gives you a cadence of I, B, B, P, B, B, P. If the number was two, it would be I, B, B, P, and so on. So that's what that number does. And then reference frames refers to both P and B frames. And that refers to the number of frames searched for redundancy. And typically, you see people using anywhere between you know, two and five frames. You don't want, you know, you could, you could search up to 16 here. If you search up to 16, you're really going to lengthen your encoding time. The fact of the matter is most of the redundancies are found very proximate to the frame that you're, you're, you're starting from. You're not going to see massive redundancies from 15 frames before it um, that weren't available in, in, in frames in the interim. So a nice balance of high quality and decent encoding times is, is the number five. So again, for B-frames, there's two basic controls. What's the number? What's the reference frames? And I recommend three and five. Now, what does this look like in different encoding tools? Um, Apple Compressor, you do have the ability to insert keyframes. They recommend using automatic, because then they, that's how they insert keyframes and scene changes. And then if you want to include B-frames in a stream, you enable frame reordering. Okay, they don't let you set the B frame interval. They don't let you set the number of reference frames. That's all baked into the program. And then Adobe gives you a little bit more control. You can choose the profile and the level. Going back to Apple here, you can't choose the profile and you can't choose the level. Basically, if you're at this interface, you're producing using the main profile. The only way to produce baseline profile video in compressor is to use an iPad or an iPod preset that, that's baked into the, uh, the baseline profile. If you see this interface, you're in main profile. With Adobe Media Encoder, you can choose main, baseline, or high, and you can choose your level here. No controls over B-frame. You can set the keyframe interval. And then this is, um, this is what squeeze looked like before the last iteration. Um, you can choose the profile, you can choose entropy coding, you can choose the number of B pictures, you can choose the reference frame. And here with, um, with episode, you can choose the profile, CABAC, and then choose the level, um, dictate how the program is going to handle that. All the, all the tools are going to encode H.264 differently. Um, And, and, and they're going to give you lesser or more ability to control some of the parameters that we talked about. How many people use Compressor? A pretty popular encoding tool. How many people are using Adobe Mini Encoder? How about Squeeze? Um, episode? What are we using? Handbrake. Handbrake. And Extreme Pardon? Just Handbrake. Yeah, Handbrake is, um, I think it gives you control over these parameters. Yeah. You know, beyond these basics, as I said, you know, configuration options are going to vary greatly. Um, some encoding tools give you very few H.264 options, like Adobe Media Encoder and, and, um, and Compressor. You know, th this version of Squeeze debuted very extensive controls over the main concept H.264 codec. Now they give you pretty much all the controls that main concept makes available to them. And then if you're a Handbrake fan, it's interesting that, that Sorensen also implemented X.264 in this interface with full control over all parameters. So this is the first um, commercially available GUI tool that gives you access to X.264 and all of the encoding parameters in X.264. The other thing they do, which is quite nice, is they, I don't know, 
I don't know if Handbrake does this, but the X.264 tool I've used is X.264 Encoder. And what they do is they give you a preset, and the presets let you choose, you know, 100% of the parameters, and then if you want to, if you want to um, experiment with those, you're, you're free to do so. So I think they recommend doing slow. And what's kind of fun about the Sorensen interface is you can see parameters change depending on which setting you use. So basically, it's going through the parameters and changing them. And then if you say, well, gosh, you know, I know what you're saying I should do for, for slower, but what I really want to do is turn this on, then you can do that. OK, so it gives you, it lets you choose a preset, and then it lets you customize the preset. So if you're an X.264 user, very high quality codec, very, you know, it's a good, it's a very solid codec. This is a nice alternative. You know, main concept is also a very high quality codec, and they have the same paradigm. Basically, they've got a slider here where you can choose between lower quality and faster encoding, better quality and slower encoding, and you can see the options change as I drag the slider, and any of those that you want to change, you just click, and then you can change those. So Squeeze, Squeeze has done a lot in this current version. In terms of quality, I haven't really tested it. Um, the last time I looked at these encoding tools, you know, all of the encoding tools except for Apple were kind of in the same place. Um, most of them use main concept. Main concept is pretty much the equivalent of X.264 codec. You're not going to see a lot of quality differential. Um, any of the tools that we've talked about tend to do a pretty good job. So Apple Compressor uses the Apple codec. It's limited to the main profile, doesn't do the high profile, doesn't enable CABAC encoding. So Apple Compressor is just not a good alternative unless you use the open source X.264 encoder plugin and then you get, you get pretty good quality. You know, how should you configure your video um, from, a, from a resolution and data rate standpoint? These are some reference configurations that I you know, these are files that I downloaded in the last week or so, and then check the resolution and the codec and the data rate just to see what these, you know, what the networks were doing and what the corporations were doing. So if you're saying, you know, gosh, I like the 640 by 360 resolution, what data rate should I use? You know, it's pretty, pretty, um, pretty interesting what CNN's doing, right? Because they, they ship a lot of streams, they care about quality, but they also care about efficiency, and that's why I wanted to provide these to you. Apple is kind of funny. Um, you know, they've got, for their iPhone 4S video, they're shipping an 848 by 480 video at over 3 megabits a second, which is just huge. Um, but they care about quality, I'm sure it looks great, or it does look great. And um, what's interesting about all these numbers is if your video is at 200 kilobits per second or 400 kilobits per second because you think you can't transmit a higher quality stream to viewers out there, you know, that's just not the case anymore. I mean, ESPN just went up to a, I think they've got an 848 by 480 stream at two megabits a second, you know, in their adaptive streaming schema. So data rates have really gone up. You know, with, with, um, with HTML5, you don't have the ability to do adaptive streaming yet. That's probably coming through a standard called Dash. But um, you're limited to single file streams, and these are some configurations you can look at when you're choosing your own stream. And you know, if you care to learn more about encoding for iDevices, I've got a whole session on that um, this afternoon. In terms of H.264 specific encoding tutorials, um, these are tutorials that I've posted to Vimeo in the last couple of years. The, uh, they're not 100% current, but they're still pretty useful. Except for Squeeze, the programs haven't changed that much from an H.264 control perspective. So if you're, if you're using Compressor, you can go check out the tutorial on Vimeo, and that'll give you a you know, good idea how to, how to choose your, your parameters. Same thing with, with most of these other videos. And in terms of HTML5, the summary, um, use the MP4 container format. Otherwise, the browser might call another player. If you're producing for the computer only, Use the high profile with CABAC. Um, B frame B frames enabled with an interval of three and five reference frames. If you're producing for
computers and iDevices, then you have to conform to the lowest common denominator. Okay, what is WebM? Um, WebM is the VPA codec that Google purchased from Onto, or they, they acquired when they purchased Onto, the open source Vorbis audio codec, and a uh, WebM container format that's based on the Matroska open source container format. It's open source royalty free, um, currently supported in Chrome, Opera, and Firefox, as we saw earlier, and Google has announced they're going to supply plugins for Internet Explorer 9 and Safari. So obviously that's kind of ironic, you know, you get HTML5 support via plugin, but you know, it's just everybody wants uniform codec support and it's just not available. There is the MPEG LA committee, you know, who controls the patent rights to to uh, to H.264. They have they have um, they made an announcement a couple of months ago where they said that, that uh, there are eight or nine people who say they have technology that, I'm trying to think of the technical words. Basically, they're saying they have patents that VPA violates. Okay, so there's a chance that MPEG LA or the group of patent holders that they're representing may go out and challenge VPA as infringing on their patents. Now, MPEG LA, you know, this is like your kid threatening to run away from home, right? I mean, they, MPEG LA is, has talked about suing people and suing people for OGG, suing people for VPA, suing people for WebM. I don't think they've done it at all. But, um, and you know, to an extent, WebM has had so little market penetration, I don't think it's hurting at H.264, so I'm not sure why they would. But if WebM really caught on, they, you know, they have some attorneys who've reviewed the patents, reviewed the claims, and they say VPA infringes. I don't, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't think it's significant. A lot of companies are using WebM. Um, but it's, it's something you should at least keep in mind. You know, if you talk to Microsoft, which I did yesterday, you know, the, the top line reason they give for not supporting WebM is, is that. They're saying, we're a big company. We think there are potential patent issues out there. We're the first one who's going to get sued. We're the deep pockets, so we're not going to, we're going to stay away from it. So that's kind of the top line support. Adobe announced they were going to support WebM in Flash when Google announced WebM. It's been you know, 18 months, four or five Flash versions, no WebM support. I'm sure they would tell you it's also intellectual property issues that they're avoiding. You know, I think it's more competition-related issues. Um, either way, you should be aware that those spots are out there. You know, there are, if you go to um, the dive into HTML5 site that we looked at before when we looked at browser compatibility of the various HTML5 um, codecs, you'll see there's a number of WebM GUI-based encoding tools. There's also a command line tool, um, and I'll show you where to pick that up uh, in, in, a, in a slide in a few moments. Um, I looked at all of those tools that were listed in a review that I produced back in, um, in December of 2010 that I updated in May for the book. And basically what I did was Google produced a file for me when I gave a presentation here last year that I wanted to compare the quality of VP8 versus H.264. So I know how to encode H.264. I sent my source files to Google and I said produce the best quality VP8 file that you could produce. So they did that. I compared H.264 and VP8, and they were very, very close. I mean, VP8 is a very good, very high quality video compression technology. It's really more implementation issues that are, are really limiting it. But I took that file, which, you know, which is the best case for VP8, it was produced by the people who, who produced the codec, and then I encoded files to similar parameters with all these tools that are listed on the dive into HTML5 site. So if you go to, let me not do that. Um, and then, so I looked at these tools and, and you know, I produced the files, then I compared them to the Google file, and the Mira Video Converter, it's free, we like free, but, um, but you can't configure the presets, and it dropped frames during encoding. So 
So even though it can produce a WebM file, it's not a commercially useful tool. Same thing with Firefox. You know, the output didn't match the configuration input. And if I wanted a 644.80 file, it couldn't produce it. Um, and there was no data rate configuration for the audio. So they basically gave me what they wanted to give me. Um, it's the best free alternative. Again, it's good for experimentation, but it's not a production tool. Telstream episode, this is version 6.1. Um, this is a very good alternative if you're producing WebM. It was the fastest encoding tool, about 18% faster than Sorensen Squeeze. Equal quality to the, um, to the Google encoded clip, um, but very few VP8 configuration options. And my thought about that is who needs options if the quality is good? You know, I vastly prefer a no-look, high-quality encode than having to tinker with a lot of factors to, to try and make it look good. So episode is kind of the fast, easy-to-use, high-quality option. And Squeeze gives you, and this is Squeeze 7, and it's the same thing in Squeeze 8, they give you access to most of the, H, the WebM encoding options you can access in the command line encoding tool. So if you want to customize, if you want to tinker, Squeeze is the tool that you want to use. Quality was the same as, as, a, as Episode and Google, and um, speed was about 18% slower than Episode. And that kind of summarizes the, um, you know, the discussion that we've had to this point the, uh, on WebM. And all of the resources on WebM are available at the webmproject.org. And the tools in the command line that I talked about are available tools and coder parameters. If you download the PDF file, you'll have the URL. In terms of um, live options for WebM, there are, there are some that are out there, um, none that have been in, in broad commercial use that I'm aware of. And as far as I know, none of the major hardware encoding vendors, you know, the Digital Rapids, Viewcast, and Vivio, Cisco, have, have provided a, an encoding tool for, for live WebM. I just, that's not available. Anybody doing live WebM at this point? OK, we're, we're not, I think there are, there are enough projects out there to kind of prove the concept it can be done, but um, I just don't think a lot of people are using it at this point. There's the obligatory pitch for the book. And any questions? We got about, I think we have 15 minutes. Are we finishing at 12.30 or 12.15? Pardon? OK, do we have time for questions if we have any? Okay, so the question is, what kind of audio bit rate should you use for H.264 or for WebM? Um, the, so as we, we talked about it, so, so what kind of audio parameters can you use for H.264? You can use any of the variations. So there's A, C, L, C. You know, the typical encoding presentation is going to be something like this. You've got A, C. AC version 1, AC version 2. For in the tests that I've done, again, there are no specs that I've seen. You can use any of those options because they all play. If you want the broadest compatibility, particularly with iDevices, I would use AAC and not either one of these because those higher level, the, the, uh, the Apple specs say that iDevices only, only play back AAC LC. Okay, so I would use that. And in terms of bit rate, you know, the, there's really no difference between, you know, okay, well, I didn't, I didn't include this. Um, the same, you know, what you're seeing typically is between 64 and 128 kilobits per second. If you're, if you're dealing with mono source, if we encoded this presentation, I'm working off a mono lavalier microphone, you know, hopefully we'll distribute this at 64 kilobits per second mono. If, you know, if we had a band up here, um, you might want to go to 128 kilobits per you know, stereo. Any other questions? The data rates are in kilobits per second. Say it again? The data rate is in kilobits per second, right? Yes. So the data rates on that slide are kilobits per second. If people weren't here when I got here or when I started, um, 
The presentation is available at my website, which is streaminglearningcenter.com, encoding for HTML5, and it will be available on the streaming media website probably in the next day or so. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding. Oh, closed captions? Um, closed captions under HTML5 at this point, as far as I know, are not are not widely implemented. There are some solutions that are starting to be talked about, but, but I'm not seeing them in broad implementation at this point. Is DRM possible with HTML5? Is DRM possible with HTML5? Um, yeah, but it's, I think it's much, much harder because you know if, if, if Microsoft decides to do DRM for Silverlight, they just do it and they implement in every version of Silverlight. If someone proposes DRM for HTML5, they have to convince every browser vendor to support it. Apple's got their own DRM. Microsoft's got their own DRM. So it's really, it really does extend the process in terms of getting people to support. You know, the only alternative, of course, is a plugin for DRM. But then you've got, you know, you're back to the whole using a plugin to make a a technology that's supposed to be non-plugin based work. Um, I'm curious about the answer. Can you six four? Okay. Okay. Does X264 produce the HTML compatible screen? And if it is, it can be used as an HTML5. Is your your question is does X.264 Produce a compatible stream with HTML5. Yes. yes, I mean it's it's so because it's a standard space codec, um, you can you know different vendors can create codecs. You know Microsoft is the only one who can create a VC1 codec. Onto is the only one who can create a VP6 codec. But a lot of different people can produce an H.264 codec. And the way you define the codec is the ability to play back in an H.264 player. So when you create the codec, all your, what you're most concerned about is broad compatibility on the playback side. So, you know, for, for I've experimented with it and have no trouble with it, and I'm sure Sorensen wouldn't have used X.264 if it didn't play in HTML5 compatible browsers. So the answer, short answer is yes, it should play back pretty much everywhere. And it's, interestingly, it's something I didn't know you know, I always thought that X.264 was kind of an open source um, kind of pirate project. You know, just a bunch of guys, smart guys, and spread over the globe, coding at night, that kind of thing. But actually, when, when Sorensen integrated X.264 in their program, they're paying a licensing fee. So there is, there is actually a, a bunch of folks. It's kind of like Kaltura, right? Kaltura is an open source online video platform. Everything's open source. They'll give you code to use if you want to use it. But they also have a value-added component that you can buy. And so I think X.264 is kind of like that as well. So this is a licensed technology they're paying for. It's not a, you know, a code base they kind of grab from a website somewhere and just put in their product. I was just going to say one thing I noticed with X.264 that you actually have to specify that you want it for web encoding. Otherwise, it'll take that metadata nugget at the beginning of the file and it'll put it at the end so it won't do a progressive download. So there are a few settings, at least in Handbrake, when you're using X264, you have to set for display on the web or for local. Okay, so you're saying, and I'm just repeating for the camera, but the uh, that's a good observation. You're talking about the uh, the move atom. So you're, you know, the move atom is this bit of metadata and you want it at the start of the file because otherwise the player doesn't know what the data is and how to play it. So apparently there's a setting in Handbrake, I haven't played with it in that amount of depth where you have to set it for web because otherwise it'll put the move atom at the end and the entire file will download before it starts to play. So it should play, but you may have to adjust your settings to, to make it play well. Um, how about 
how we know what are the raw files that these encoders support? Like Sony camera or Canon, with the raw files we pay, how we know which encoder we should pick? Okay, so you're, you're, you're wondering which of these encoding tools support different source formats? Right. Um, are you talking about the open source ones or are you talking about the for fee ones? Both S264 encoders and the open source. Um, that's a good question. You know, the, the um, episode, episode does a great job with format support. That's one of, the, one of the things they really hope to differentiate their product with. Um, Sorensen added support for, this, this is not what you're asking, but Avid D, DBs, NX, whatever their HD format is. They also added ProRes support, both input and output. So you'd have to check the specs from, from the different products. And on the open source tools, you know, the command line stuff, I'm not sure how that would work. You, you typically could probably find a plugin, a way to kind of make it work, but it, it may not work without those plugins. Um, good, good question. Uh, I just don't know the answer to it. Is that so No, the, um, so does episode encode live video? No, they don't, but they do have a program called Wirecast that's very, 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 very capable, very, very competent. If you Google my name and Wirecast, you'll see some, some stuff I've written on it. The other alternatives, I guess, Adobe Flash Live Media Encoder is a free alternative, up to three streams if you're doing adaptive. Um, Microsoft Expression Encoder does a great job, and then the Coolabyte Encoder, um, the Coolabyte Extreme. Cool got, Coolabyte got bought by Heyvision, and um, that's a really high performance, high quality H.264 live encoding tool. I did a, a roundup of all those of all those tools in the May June time frame, I think. So you can you can find that on streamingmedia.com. Uh, uh, you were using MPEG for doing this. Uh, Say it again. We were using FFmpeg for doing the uh, converting uh, a raw stream to an H.264. Um, so what are the you know the um, th it's a it's a great question. Um, there is no royalty, so the, the way the MPEG LA contract works, as I understand it, which is my way of saying <laughs> check with your lawyer. But um, is as long as you don't produce more than two hundred thousand encoding tools, you don't owe them a royalty. So they've got a de minimis of a pretty high number. So if you're doing a one-off or a two-off or even a 10-off or a 20-off encoding station with X.264, the freely downloadable codec, and FFmpeg, you don't owe them anything. And I've, I've asked them that question directly because I thought it was a pretty important question, and, they, uh, and that was their answer. So if you use FFmpeg, you don't need to pay? Yeah, as long as you're not, as long as you're not creating an encoding tool in quantities in excess of 200,000, I think that's the magic number, then you don't have to, you don't have to pay any of that. Also, um, can you programmatically add uh, uh, the chapters with the combination in uh, the HTML5? Uh, so can you create chapter thumbnails in HTML5? Um, I don't know. I mean, you probably can do anything you want. The question is, how hard is it? Um, so I'm not aware of any tools that are doing that right now. Um, I'm trying to think if Google has any kind of chaptering in their HTML5 presentations. Um, but I don't know. I asked a question for some reason I want to buy your magazine. And, uh, is there going to be a store in the streaming magazine? Magazine or both? I'm sorry, you both. Um, it's not available on Amazon. So it's, it's um, but it's not, there's no place here to buy. When did it release the first May. I was in Europe two weeks ago and then I came back and I had a bunch, I just forgot to order. My bad. <laughs> Any other questions? Good, thanks for your time.